I can't tell you how wonderful it is to be with you all um, each month as we listen to a variety of people talking about how women have been erased from our tradition, you know, whether it's in the lectionary or the Bible or in our history and in our traditions. And I'm so thrilled to ha uh, have you join us tonight, have uh, Dr. Tara Tuttle join us tonight. And she's gonna talk to us about how the media actually has um, played down, uh, covered up in a sense, uh, the, the abuse of nuns in the Catholic Church. And so it's gonna be a very, very interesting topic. I'm so excited, but I wanna just first welcome you to remind you all that we are going to be recording these sessions uh, and so that we're asking that everyone uh, would just um, know that so that people who aren't able to join us will be able to follow us uh, later on. So um, uh, just uh, hold on just a second. Oh, we're... Okay, um, I just <laughs> want to make sure my everything is quiet here. So, um, so I want to start with a prayer tonight. So um, if we could just gather um, and pray together. Um, let me just begin with, we give you thanks, Holy One, that you speak to us in ways that often surprise and challenge us. And so we pause at the beginning of this time together. Let us remind ourselves to listen to your voice and to ask for your grace. Open our eyes to read the signs of the times. Open our ears to hear voices that challenge us. Open our hearts to love a new world into being. And I wanna to start tonight with um, a little bit of a reading. Uh, Russ has put together this enormously beautiful prayer service called Voices That Challenge. And in one of those readings, uh, it fits perfectly tonight. So um, I'd like to read it as we begin. This is a reading from Melissa Cedillo on how the church can learn from the Me Too movement in her blog post. This was on uh, Women's Ordination Conference blog. Uh, so um, I wanted to read a little bit from that. She says, Me Too has empowered survivors to come forward and forced abusers to face consequences. Therefore, we should use the strengths of Me Too to shed light on how to respond to the despair in our church. Thoughts and prayers from our bishops will not suffice. Neither will bishops who downplay the crisis or aim to defer the conversation to homosexuality with the number of victims identified in the Pennsylvania report to at least 1,000. There is clearly a need to rethink how the church is structured. In fact, to not do so would be a sin. <clears throat> Amen. So I'm gonna start by introducing our speaker tonight. I am so thrilled. Um, Dr. Professor Tara Tuttle is the Assistant Dean of Diversity and Inclusion and a senior lecturer at the Lewis Honors College at the University of Kentucky. She has a PhD in Humanities with an emphasis in 20th century American culture a graduate certificate in women and gender studies from the University of Louisville, and an MA in humanities from India State University. Passionate about honors education, she worked in the honors program at Indiana State University, taught honors courses as affiliate faculty in the honors program at Ball State University, and developed the honors program at St. Catherine College, now closed, before joining the faculty in the Lewis Honors College at the University of Kentucky. Her research examines contemporary women writers' uses of scriptural allusion 
to challenge conventional understandings of gender and justice. She is interested in the ways in which members of marginalized or contested groups deploy biblical allusion to prompt reconsideration of hierarchical interpretations of scripture used to validate social, political, and legal inequalities as moral or divinely mandated. Her recent contribution, Nuns Too, in Crisis and Challenge in the Roman Catholic Church, provides a window into the research she conducted on that topic. This is a fabulous book, and Dr. Tuttle's um, essay is in here for further reading. So um, I'll, we'll send this out in the chat room later, but we, I just wanted you to see it. So with those words, I can't tell you how thrilled I am, how excited I am about this, and I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Tuttle. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, and thank you everyone for coming out tonight. I'm just humbled by this turnout and this global audience. Um, that's, that's so incredible. Um, Thank you. I, I want to start um, by saying that um, my dear friend, Sister Mary Louise Edwards of the Dominican Sisters of Peace of St. Catherine is with us tonight, and she um, has been central to my spiritual formation and edification, and this piece wouldn't have been written if she and the Dominican Sisters of Peace hadn't made me absolutely fall in love with nuns and sisters. <laughs> Um, but I also want to start with a trigger warning. This presentation repeatedly refers to sexual assault and may be upsetting to some viewers. Please prepare or care for yourselves and of course step away from this conversation if you need to um, and reach out to support professionals if you need to. Anyone can call the National Sexual Assault Hotline at 1-800-656-4673. Seven three, twenty-four 24 hours a day. So this is from my chapter called Hashtag Nuns 2, Media Coverage of Sexual Violence Against Nuns and Sisters After Me Too. The sexual assaults of women religious is of course not a new story. In 1994, an Irish nun, Sister Maureen O'Donohue, prepared an extensive report for the Vatican on just such abuse of nuns by priests in 22 countries. It was shelved. In 1998, the National Survey of the Sexual Trauma Experience of Catholic Nuns by John T. Chibnall, Ann Wolfe, and Paul Duckrow provided data suggesting as much as 40% of women religious had experienced sexual assault. But readers of print and online media reports of the Catholic Church sexual abuse crisis might never consider women religious among the victims, given the media erasure of their stories. The results of this study, for example, did not break into mainstream media coverage until six years after its initial publication, not until after the Boston Globe spotlight team broke open the story of the Catholic Church sexual abuse crisis and cover-ups in 2002. Finally, in 2003, St. Louis dispatch reporter Bill Smith included their findings. Still, Professor Mary Marcel's media analyses of the coverage of the crisis in the early 2000s found that almost no attention was paid to female victims. She points out that even the Globe did not cover the story at first. They eventually did, but minimally and not until a year after their initial report. Given that this violence against women religious had been studied in 1998, that many victims came forward after the Globe's coverage in 2001, and that researchers at St. Louis University followed with a study completed in 2006 that found nearly 10% of women religious in 123 orders in the U.S. had been sexually exploited by an adult male or female clergy member, why was the abuse of nuns and sisters by clergy still considered breaking news in 2018? The media's disinterest in news affecting women and girls 
often attributed to the public's disinterest, has devastating effects. Victims feel alone and suffer in silence and shame. Potential jurors, law enforcement officers, school officials, coaches, counselors, family members, and others routinely disbelieve victims when they have exposed to no or faulty media representations of sexual violence. Survivors may not know where to seek help. Representation matters, and the media erased or distorted the violence women and girls experienced at the hands of clergy. Violence against women and girls was deemed something not worth talking about. We expect it, it happens, and so it isn't news, explains Marcel. She continues, the question has been raised as to whether in the eyes of the church hierarchy, there was no scandal if the victims were female. She observes this was compounded because some evidence suggests that the Globe had decided female cases were not of interest back in 2002. Furthermore, this underreporting made it more difficult for female victims to come forward and win credibility of group reinforcement, which so often preceded the award of financial restitution in or out of court. When a Boston area SNAP, that survivor's network of those abused by priest, when a Boston area SNAP member contacted the very Globe reporters investigating the church crisis and offered details of her own story, she was told stories against girls were not of interest. This makes it unsurprising then that in 2007, Marcel wrote, the US press never succeeded in covering the full magnitude of the crisis as it emerged worldwide, that it involved adult women as well as girls and boys, that it involved clerical as well as lay victims, that it involved accusations of both physical abuse even unto death, as well as sexual abuse and rape. The prior framing of this story of the Catholic Church sexual abuse crisis persists in ways that continues to contribute to the silencing of female victims of this crisis, even, at his, even as it has become attached to the larger Me Too narrative. In the 2018 panel discussion, Overcoming Silence, Women's Voices in the Catholic Abuse Crisis, a symposium hosted by Voices of Faith, an international initiative to empower women in the Catholic Church. Former SNAP Outreach Director Barbara Doris stated, at SNAP, the victims we help were about 40% girls. Robert Mickens responded, the picture we've been given by a lot of people in the church, especially bishops, says that these victims are mostly teenage boys. Doris explains, but that's part of the smokescreen. Because if you say the victims are teenage boys, then it's a homosexual problem, and it's not. Homosexuals are less likely to sexual assault a child than a heterosexual, but now they've got everybody talking about homosexuality, and all of a sudden we've risked the real topic, she says, which is children, boys and girls, being sexually assaulted. Not only did this framing render invisible little girls as victims, it obscured the abuse against nuns and sisters by clergy. However, Marcel points out that this actually benefited the Vatican and shaped their strategy to the reports of sexual violence. One could conclude that the US press in a strange alignment with the Vatican's position characterized almost the entire crisis as a matter of abuses within the US and overwhelmingly involving boys, she explains. She says this was the framing they wanted through which they were able to argue that the problem was limited to already sinful people, given that church doctrine considers homosexual acts sinful. Ignoring and suppressing violence against girls and women, and women religious in particular, allowed them to contain the story and save potentially millions of dollars in reparations. The media, by deciding violence against girls and women wasn't newsworthy, and by creating or at least accepting this homophobic and pedophilic framing, became complicit in the ongoing suppression and enduring abuse of other victims. This erasure was exacerbated by rape myths about female victims and male perpetrators. One might expect nuns and sisters, given their vows of chastity and expectations of modesty, to be exempted from some rape myths that result in blaming female victims for their own assaults. However, Sue Archibald, then president of Link Up, a support group for sexual abuse victims of clergy, asserted in 2002, 
Women were treated more as seductresses who tempted priests into sin than as people who were victimized. Marcel concurs. Vatican spokesmen and Globe journalists often seem to agree. Prior to 2002, that a priest raping any woman or girl was not rape at all. At the time when victims reported, some were told by their supervisors that the crimes against them were less important than the reputations or the work of the perpetrators of the crimes. For example, Dr. Rocio Figueroa Alvear, a theologian at Good Shepherd College, was asked to help in the cause of beatification of Herman Doyle, who had assaulted her as a young woman in the lay movement Sodalizio. When she reported his abuse to deter the beatification, she was blamed and blackmailed. She was told by the priest to whom she reported Doyle's crimes, what happened to you was nothing. It doesn't matter. I'm sure that you seduced him. And it doesn't matter because we need a saint. Following this dismissal of her trauma, like many other victims, she didn't go public for years. Despite widespread abuse and a pattern of victimizing sisters and nuns, many victims of sexual assault by clergy believed they were alone. As a novitiate, Doris Wagner was raped by a priest and left her community in 2011. At the time I wrote this chapter, the priest remained among that community. She says, it's ridiculous to say this now, but at the time I still thought I was the only nun that had ever been raped by a priest because you see, I had never heard of similar instances. I thought I was the only one. Failures of the supervisors in the institutions to respond in just or victim-centered ways meant that many survivors of sexual violence at the hands of clergy became silent carriers of trauma. They were treated in their organizations the way other victims of sexual assault had been treated by the press. If violence against women who have devoted their lives to God and have practiced chastity is not deemed newsworthy, what does this mean for other victims? If even nuns did not receive assumptions of innocence in the media, would any others? Marcel affirms, it bears witness to the most striking abuse of power that even a woman who is celibate becomes blameworthy or punished for her own rape. The very most continent and non-sexualized persons living out their celibacy by choice did not succeed in gaining sympathetic coverage by Globe reporters. This national conversation around sexual violence has changed significantly though in the years since. Social media have helped circulate information dispelling rape myths and highlighting rape culture information that has influenced public perceptions about sexual assault and victims of sexual violence. Considering the vows of chastity and expected modesty of women religious, as well as the celebrated role priests occupy in communities, I investigated several highly circulated online print media stories of sexual violence against nuns and sisters by priests in 2018. In my analyses, I considered the following points of inquiry. Does the language serve to obfuscate the most frequently identified agents of the violence against women religious, which is priests? Are nuns and sisters subject to the same rape myths that affect perceptions of other victims? What happens when modesty and chastity are assumed to victims? Do the stories offer biographical or contextual information about the victims or perpetrators' lives? Does the language lead readers to doubt the credibility of nuns and sisters? And who is blamed? Researchers Ashley Sifkas Andres and Cassandra Alexopoulos point out that in many media reports of sexual violence, the use of nominalizations such as battery or violence serve to obfuscate the agents of such violence. They explain specifically the use of words such as claim or admit can elicit disbelief among readers compared with state or report. Verbs that imply that the writer didn't believe what the original speaker said was true were also noted and referred to as language of doubt. These words include admit, allege, claim, concede, confess, lie, misinform, purport. Language of support, on the other hand, employs verbs and adverbs which imply that the writer endorsed, supported, or believed 
what the original speaker said was true, such as acknowledge, disclose, divulge, foretell, forewarn, indicate, mention, note, recall, reveal, let on, let slip, make clear, and point out. In my review of 19 reports on the sexual abuse of nuns following Me Too, I was pleasantly surprised to discover that these articles contain almost none of the verbs indicative of doubt. When sexual violence against women religious was finally covered, the victims were, created, were treated as credible, but problems still persist. Since Me Too and Nuns Too began on Twitter as a hashtag phenomena, I start by examining the most widely retweeted news items on the sexual abuse of nuns. Many of these articles include language of support, but they vary widely in their framing. The New York Times article, Pope Acknowledges Nuns Were Sexually Abused by Priests and Bishops, by Jason Horowitz and Elizabeth Diaz, possesses both a headline and an opening sentence that include one of the verbs that constitute language of support. However, by mid-article, their failure to center victims of abuse or even to center the crime of abuse itself becomes clear. Horowitz and Diaz give Pope Francis quite a bit of space in the article, quoting his defenses of the Vatican's response to their crimes. They quote Pope Francis at length. And as the head of the church, their inclusion of Pope Francis's remarks makes journalistic sense, but what they omit could significantly affect public understanding of the scope of the Vatican's inaction on the issue. What the authors of this article fail to acknowledge or put into context is that Pope Francis's words do not include language of support, but instead shield perpetrators' names and use passive constructions. Horowitz and Diaz offer no commentary, nor quote any reaction to the decision to dissolve an order of nuns rather than to simply oust the perpetrator. They do not inform the readers of the aftermath of this response. What happened to these nuns? Where did they go? Were they given any treatment for the abuse? The authors fail to address these questions, allowing Pope Francis's words to do the work of undermining support and perpetuating problematic aspects of media responses to sexual violence, even as they may be striving to support the nuns who've experienced abuse themselves. Of the case in Chile, they cite Horowitz and Diaz write, current and former nuns said women had been removed from the order when they reported the abuse. But removed by whom? What happened after they were removed? Where did they go? Were they relocated? What happened to the perpetrator? These details remain unaddressed. Citing a case in Malawi in which priests impregnated 30 sisters in one congregation, though they do identify the pregnancies as the result of the priest's actions, they simply offer as the outcome of their reporting to the archbishop that the sisters, quote, were replaced. Again, by whom and where did they go? What happened with the pregnancies? Were the women thrust into poverty, single parenthood? What happened to the babies? These omissions reflect similar diminishment of violence against women that Marcel observed in her earlier analysis. Horowitz and Diaz offer little context on institutional failures. Furthermore, what's most telling in this article is the structure. None of the last eight paragraphs of this article purportedly on the acknowledgement of sexual abuse of nuns by priests address that topic at all. Two articles from the Washington Post invoke Pope Francis, as did the New York Times piece. In Pope Francis, concern, Pope Francis confirms Catholic clergy members abused nuns, Max Rosenthal and Michelle Borstein simply off, similarly offer much of the space of their article to quotes from Pope Francis acknowledgement of the abuse and the intention to respond to it. However, they also point out that the Vatican has been criticized for its failure to respond adequately. And mention Francis's previous dismissal of accusations of one cover-up in particular. They also provide crucial context for understanding Vatican procedures that help suppress public knowledge and criminal convictions in cases of sexual abuse by clergy. And they close the article with two specific cases involving nuns harmed by clergy and a quote from a lawyer, Indelika Joseph, who states, once a nun speaks, she is thrown out of the convent 
and may find herself on the street because often her family is not willing to accommodate her. A campaign of character assassination starts. The nun will be portrayed as a prostitute. These survivors have a little recourse given their lower positions in the church hierarchy and their poverty. In what they have chosen to include in the structure of their article, Rosenthal and Borstein also cultivate sympathy for the nuns without forfeiting neutrality, illustrating the difficulties they face in reporting abuse of a hierarchy with a history of victim blaming, suppression, and cover-ups. More hopeful though is Emily Tamkin's brief article, How Women Raise Their Voices at the Vatican, which follows this article in the Washington Post coverage and brings women's voices finally into the discussion of the Vatican Sexual Abuse Summit, a summit still dominated by men. Tamkin quotes from the remarks of Nigerian nun, Sister Veronica Openibo, and Mexican journalist Valentina Alizraki, who has covered five pepices, both of whom admonished Vatican officials. And this is crucial inclusion. This disproportionate harm to women is further illustrated in founder and staff of Vatican Women's Magazine Step Down, citing pressure over non-abuse stories by Chico Harlan and Stefano Petrelli for the Washington Post. This report explained that it was because of the women's magazine Women, Churches, Women Church World's February 2019 report on the abuse of nuns that Pope Francis was asked about the violence they faced and that the founder Lucetta Scarafia and all female staff of the magazine stepped down in mass citing what they call a newly difficult work environment and a Vatican attempt to undercut the women's voices on sensitive issues including the sexual abuse of nuns. Harlan and Petrelli describe the Vatican as a male-dominated world and note that the magazine only recently captured global attention after its report on the abuse of nuns by clerics and of forced abortions. They include the response from L'Osservatore Romano, the Vatican newspaper, editor Andrea Monda, who maintained that Women's Church World was not being disempowered or interfered with, but they also note that Scarafia felt La Servitore Romano had been publishing pieces that contradicted the Women Church World editorial line, and that an attempt to replace her with Manda had occurred. This article shows the pressure women face following the voicing of allegations, even women employed by the Vatican. In Nuns 2, How the Catholic Church Has Worked to Silence Women Challenging Abuse, Lila Rice Goldenberg offers a historical perspective that provides a fuller understanding for readers following the stories of sexual abuse of nuns by clergy. Her reporting in the Washington Post's Made in History series presents the nuns as credible and shows the pattern of silencing that has allowed the abuse to continue relatively unchecked. Goldenberg offers examples that date back hundreds of years, damning evidence that bolsters the credibility of contemporary nuns and sisters and their harrowing stories of intimidation, blackmail, and expulsion following reporting abuse by clergy. By including this article tracing the historical legacy of suppression, the Washington Post not only provides readers a deeper understanding of the long story of sexual abuse by women religious, it illuminates why the Vatican has felt safe in its perpetrations of injustices against these victims and others. Another article in the Washington Post Made in History series illuminates the suppression of women's voices and survivor testimonies by the Catholic Church. In When the Catholic Church's Prohibition on Scandal Helped Women, Sarah McDougall explains that causing scandal was considered a sin not just for the perpetrator of the sin, but also for anyone who made that sin public. This understanding has tragically justified the quiet transfer of pedophile priests from one diocese to another, she writes. What is needed she says, is another version of scandal theology, the notion that public confession, restitution, and rehabilitation can forge a more authentic community of the faithful. Her call for reform and revitalization offers optimism for the future of the church and women's places within it. Disappointingly, though, the Washington Post, despite its careful attention to the topic, did not cover the symposium held by Voices of Faith on November 27, 2018 in Rome. During the symposium, several survivors of abuse by priests told their stories. Unlike the mainstream news articles on the abuse, the survivors indict the patriarchal 
and hierarchical structure of the church that devalues women. In the opening address, Professor Cetina Militello asserts, behind violence, there is always the delusion of omnipotence. Behind this kind of violence is the very special presumption that they have as churchmen to feel and be recognized as holders of a sacred power. Precisely for this reason, they place themselves above the rules. Other participants at the symposium agreed. Former nun Doris Wagner states, the reason why they don't act, it's the monarchical power of the church. It's the fact that there's no proper separation of powers inside the church. Furthermore, Wagner insists their lack of action makes it very clear that they are not acting in the interest of the church. Wagner here reminds listeners and readers that the church is not merely the empowered hierarchy, but also the women religious and the body of believers. The incredible accounts offered in the symposium could have yielded significant news reports and insight into the ways the patriarchal structure of the church contribute to its very own rape culture. But this symposium organized by women and dominated by survivors' voices did not garner the same media attention as the Vatican summit. Though prior media framing of sexual assault and the Catholic Church sexual abuse crisis had been tipped towards men and boys in initial reports and responses, the transformative effects of Me Too on media practices are evident in the recent coverage of the longstanding, centuries-old problem of violence against women religious by clergy. This better balance wrought by Me Too and Nuns Too finally forced Pope Francis and Vatican officials to address violence against women and girls. When an institution will not hold itself accountable, the media can help by shedding light on its injustices. The effects of this on church reform remain to be seen, but the change in reporting offers hope that change in the Vatican response to the violence against its own women religious might follow. Victims, Activists, church members, and others have long hoped for a compassionate, trauma-informed Vatican response stemming from concern for the victims of violence. But many see only a too late reaction motivated by self-preservation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tara. Oh, wow. Um, just a few, before I open it up for the question and answer period, just a few comments. Um, I'm not sure if you knew this, Tara, but Voices of Faith themselves were pressured by many people to not do that symposium. Mm -hmm. And in some cases by some uh, uh, nuns themselves. So there's so much fear in the institution around raising these questions that they really had to push ahead Mm -hmm. up and against uh, some, some pretty significant pressure to even have the event. So that, that just as another piece of that. And uh, it was interesting because Bob Mickens, Robert Mickens was the MC for that event. And he was, you could, first of all, it was clear that even for Bob, it was like new information. And at a different, in a different way, he got it. I think this is, this is telling even in Catholic media, that's often, um, you know, um, very sort of male run and male through the lens of men. Uh, and, and so I think even for him, it was a wake up call. And he was very frustrated afterwards that there wasn't more media attention for the Voices of Faith event. So it was a significant event uh, that was, I, and I give all the credit to Chantal Gert, Gertz and, and the whole team for making sure that that went forward. The other thing that I wanted to let people know, because Russell talked about this, is Doris Wagner, one of the women at the Voices of Faith event, will be at our, uh, on October 22nd, will receive the Chris Schenck uh, Award for Young Catholic Leadership. Um, and uh, she, you'll get to hear from her firsthand a little bit about her experience as well. Uh, I also just have all the admiration in the world for the women who have spoken out against great odds and with a lot of suffering, uh, they have uh, told the story and it has been made the whole church better for women and men. So um, just wanted to bring a couple of those points out. I'm really so thankful for your, the beautiful way you've, you've really woven all these pieces together and help us understand the framework 
for how to look at even the media articles that we receive to see what the language is like. Is it, is it obscuring the truth? Is it supporting victims? Very, very important. So thank you very much. So mm -hmm. enough of me talking. I want to let you ask questions. Now, in this forum, what we do is we ask you to open your, um, you know, unmute yourself but don't speak until I've given you the uh, like call on you because otherwise we're all talking over each other. So if you have a question, please unmute yourself. You end up going, you go to the top of my list here and I will call on you as you unmute yourself. So um, I see Rita Houlihan, oh. you have opened your mic, so go for it. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Tuttle very much. Um, so I'm uh, curious about the um, abuse of young girls um, I know there was the case of the, in the, um, the school for the deaf in Wisconsin, I believe the priest who was primarily, the, the primary um, uh, perpetrator there abused both girls and boys, but the boys were more emphasized. So, so, and yeah, so I'm, I'm interested to know if there's any research on uh, reporting of, of young girls being abused also. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, as you mentioned, the crimes against boys are routinely emphasized. Um, so I have not, um, other than Mary Marcel's earlier analysis, her, her analysis preceded mine, I haven't seen other research specifically on um, media treatment of girls in the Catholic sexual abuse crisis. But more broadly, it is harder to get the media to pay attention to girls um, as victims. And this deals, I think, with the homophobia that is still prevalent in our culture that makes um, the story of violence against boys seemingly more salacious, but also, of course, patriarchy, which says that boys are more valuable than girls. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, let's see here. Um, moving to, are there, are there other people that would have a question for Dr. Tuttle tonight? Okay, Cheryl Ann, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much for your, your presentation. It's been very, very interesting. I've been following the situation of the nuns that have been abused and, and often killed in uh, India. Do you have any more information about that? No, I'm, I'm afraid I don't. What, uh, share with us what's happening. Oh, I can't see if I can remember it. I, I did some work on it about a couple of years ago. Um, apparently, there were a couple of convents where nuns started to appear um, uh, drowned in, uh, in a well, and that was associated then later with abuse by, I think, a local bishop. And he, one of the bishops was, um, has gone through the civil process and found guilty, but um, there's been a lot of conflict, a lot of um, uh, delay in, in the whole process, and uh, I haven't looked into it within the last year or so. Oh goodness! I, I hate to hear that. Um, I'll definitely, I'll definitely look into that. My, because my research focused on the effects of Me Too, um, that meant that certain contexts um, were more. It's it centered, uh, it's centered in American gaze. The Me Too movement didn't really have a kind of completely global. Um, spread. But that's, yeah, but that story is, but the violence against women religious is certainly a global pr predicament, a global problem. Yeah, thank you for bringing that to my attention. I'm so sorry to hear that. I can story. actually, I can actually uh, connect you with some of the women in India who know this problem quite well, uh, Tara. So uh, mm. glad, to, glad to bring you in contact with them for further uh, research. Uh, Gail DeGeorge, go ahead. Yes, uh, Gail DeGeorge, I'm the editor of Global Sisters Report, which is part of uh, National Catholic Reporter, and we actually just carried that story about the sisters who have been found dead in the last few year, you know, years uh, with our partners, Matters India. So we carried an extensive story about this just within the last two weeks. And then in addition, we have been covering pretty extensively, very extensively, 
against really difficult reporting odds, uh, the, the trial that's involving the bishop there and the rape of the sister. So uh, you can find those, those articles on our website. And I applaud the work that you've been doing in terms of compiling this. It's not, I know how difficult it is to, to even you know, get the compilation. I would just kindly point out that uh, NCR actually did report on those earlier studies back in 2001. And mm -hmm. the back and then, even back then, admitted. I mean, when I did some work on this myself in 2018, it was clear that the Vatican admitted that there was an issue and said that there would be, you know, address, they would address it and nothing happened. Mm -hmm. What was interesting in an article that I pulled together, because again, you know, you have to in the media figure out where you're going to uh, focus, is that I reported back on what the sisters in Africa were doing themselves to combat the situation. And it was really interesting mm -hmm. about how they were trying to empower their own sisters and training them essentially to thwart situations and uh, uh, that would lead to an avoid of situations that could lead to abuse. So that I thought was interesting that the women themselves were taking some steps in this when the Vatican would not. Yeah, yeah that's, that's wonderful to hear. That's wonderful to hear. Um, unfortunately, it mimics what we see happening in Greek life which is where a larger kind of patriarchal institution is failing to respond. So the women within it are trying, right? There's of course, um, you know, the statistics are really very staggering. You're much more likely to experience sexual assault in a fraternity house than on other places affiliated with campus. And so that means of course, Greek women are much more likely to experience sexual assault. And we see, um, my sister is a violence prevention advocate She's the director of sexual misconduct at Vanderbilt, for example. And so, you know, she and I have talked a lot about how impressive their efforts are, the Greek women, to combat sexual violence against women when we don't see similar efforts from Greek men. And it's um, wonderful to see that response of the women themselves, but it's just further evidence of patriarchy, right? You know, that they have to figure out how to respond given the failures of an institutional response of these male dominated situations. I also want to say I'm a huge fan of National Catholic Reporter. Um, I just, just love it so much. Um, my paper, my chapter here um, was really organized by what were the most retweeted stories. So that ended up being New York Times and Washington Post pieces. Understood. No harm done. <laughs> I don't take offense to things like that, but I just wanted to point out that we do, the other thing is that we stay with the story. I mean, long after the national press have moved on, we're mm -hmm. sticking it. We've been covering this McLaughlin trial extensively, so mm -hmm. we'll continue to. I'm sorry I'm behind on it, but I'll do my homework. Mm -hmm. So we have a question from Mary Pettis. Um, yes, I also wanted to say that I love National Catholic Reporter. I spoke with a priest actually yesterday in regard to the Knights of Columbus, and I gave him an article from the Na National Catholic Reporter that I read about the Knights of Columbus. So um, he promised that he would read it and get back to me. So I wanna thank you for that. And then the second part is, um, I just wanted to mention also the, um, since COVID started, I've been reading more. And I, well, I read a book from the 1980s where in, there was a nun murdered in a hospital. Um, a Sisters of Mercy um, nun was killed by a priest. And then there, there's a movie on Netflix about a nun that was murdered in Baltimore um, in the late 60s. So I just wanted to mention also about that there have been murders of <clears throat> nuns by police. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. So, uh, Kay Ferlani, you have your hand up? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, I haven't quite formulated my question, but these are the thoughts that are going through my mind is that is the, 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 my belief that we are church. We are the church. It is our church. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. 
Hold up, Kay. You accidentally got muted. Our okay. Phone. Am I okay now? Yeah, yes. go for it. Repeat. Okay. Again. All right. All right. Um, and what I was trying starting to say is I'm not sure how I want to formulate my question, but what I'm what I'm thinking is that we are church. It is our church, and the failure to um, uh, to to not preach the gospel. I, mm -hmm. I mean, it is such a blatant failure in preaching the gospel on the part of. Um, you know, of the Vatican, of the clergy, that whole system. And I guess what I'm saying, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering is, what can we do um, to reclaim our church and to reclaim the gospel? Because the men, the clergy particularly, are not doing it. That's my question. <laughs> 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 thank, uh, thank you so much. Um, yes, that, that's, that is a great question. That is a great question. And yes, I, um, I share these concerns, I uh, share these concerns. You know what is, what has been interesting to me as I have worked more and more in sexual violence prevention um, is that we don't hear it addressed very often at all. We don't hear it addressed very often at all. Um, now, I'll be, I'll be quite open with you. I was raised evangelical fundamentalist and came to Catholicism in adulthood. So I have a different background, but I didn't hear any sermons about sexual violence. I didn't hear any sermons about domestic violence and I was in church all the time, mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah, I, I didn't hear a single one. And we would have women with black eyes in the pews. Mm -hmm. You know, we got a lot of messaging about abstinence somehow without any real kind of frank conversation about sexual violence. Why is that not addressed as sinful behavior? Why is that not addressed as a crime against the dignity of persons? I don't understand. I think that silence is a part of rape culture. I think that silence contributes to the shaming of victims. I think that keeps all of this in the dark. So, you know, Kay, I really appreciate um, the enthusiasm of your response because I, I agree. We need to have a much more frank discussion about what it means to have a kind of contemporary Christian sexual ethic that is protective and it's, it's very it's very strange to me that the very communities that want to promote abstinence until marriage don't do a better job of talking about consent and sexual violence and violence prevention mm -hmm. Interesting. thank you thank you kay thanks tara i mean i you know i'm going to be 65 in a couple months i think i've heard i've i've, I've listened to maybe one um one preaching from from in a typical setting now it's different with catholic women preach but it's um mm -hmm. but you know we, we just don't hear these things we do not hear it at all and it's and it, you're right Kay. it's wrong so let's see we got peter johnstone you want to ask your question peter yeah thanks um tara thanks very much for raising this whole issue of patriarchy could i uh, interesting i'm convener of the australasian catholic coalition for church reform um, which is getting ready for the Plenary Council in Australia at present. And certainly patriarchy seems to me to be, has to be recognised as part of what is an intrinsically unjust culture, structure and approach within the church. Um, and until you deal with that, you're going to inevitably have men who don't understand, aren't able to empathise with, don't have the benefit of gender balance in their decision making, making decisions that inevitably are going to be unjust because of the unjust structure. Um, so can I just ask you to talk a little bit about the nature, the un intrinsically unjust nature of a patriarchal structure that inevitably leads to what you're talking about. Yes. Well, I think you put it pretty well. <laughs> I think you put it pretty well. Um, Right, I mean, patriarchy is a system of inequality and there's no justice with inequality. 
Patriarchy is a system that values men and boys over women and girls, and that is always going to teach a problematic power dynamic that facilitates rape culture, a culture in which rape is normalized, diminished, frequent, right? It fa patriarchy facilitates this abuse. So, you know, how, how do we, how do we move forward? Take the wind out of their sails. I, I would ask everyone else to, to who's not in, not asking questions to not speak if you've got your uh, mic un, unmuted. So please, uh, you know, just let's keep it one person at a time. Mm -hmm. um, okay, thanks, Ter. Let's move on to um, Ann Hurley Palmer. You have a question? This is uh, Grace, Grace Byerly. Grace Byerly speaking. Okay, okay, um, great. I'm, I'm wondering why you keep using the word abuse. It's rape and it's a crime. You go mm -hmm. right to the civil authorities. You don't go to church authorities. However, that doesn't always work either because when the sister was killed here in Baltimore, okay. the it, it, girls' school, um, the priest was not, the chaplain of the school was not only raping the girls, but he had police also who were coming to the, his office and raping the girls. So they were in his boots together. It was his brother was one of the policemen. So even going to the civil authorities isn't always the answer, but mm -hmm. I go to the civil authorities first. It's rape, it's a crime. I, I hear you and I don't disagree. Many victims don't want to report to police. However, because of the institutional failures they experience at the hands of law enforcement, because of the inability for juries to convict at any kind of significant rate, you know, very, very, very few perpetrators of sexual violence face any kind of legal ramifications for their crimes. And the process of reporting can further traumatize victims. So I hear you, I hear you, it is a crime. And it makes good sense to think if we treated them as crimes and prosecuted them as crimes, that would be a strong deterrent. And I think that institutions have to think hard about their role in reporting to law enforcement because so often they have not, right? But it's just, it's a hard issue because when we want to have a victim-centered approach, we try not to do anything that makes victims feel further disempowered and to give them control as much as possible in the response because sexual violence creates of course, a feeling of complete disempowerment and loss of control many times. So it's, it's just a hard, it's a hard problem to know how to solve. And we're trying lots of, you know, violence prevention advocates are trying lots of different approaches. But right now for, for most people who work at that, um, in an institutional level, in the university system, which I'm most familiar with, we're trying very hard to figure out how to provide the best care to victims of violence and not heap additional trauma upon them. And institutional betrayal happens not only in the church, right, but in the justice system. We have time, I think just one more, that's even pushing it. Elena, uh, could you, do you wanna yeah. ask a question? Uh, I wanted to point something out. Uh, besides patriarchy, I think clericalism is another big uh, cause of all this. Many people, hopefully I wasn't one of them, were raised to think that the priest is above all of us and the rest of the body of Christ has nothing. I mean, we are just the servants. Women serve and sure, they clean, they do this, they, they are on the whatever uh, basements and things like that, but they don't have anything. So when a child or a woman wants to say something, oh, you don't say that, the priest, you know, nobody believes that a priest could do something like that because priests, they have put them like they, you know, they are above of all uh, Mm -hmm. wrong. They are above of any, nobody can say anything wrong with that. I have seen, uh, I am also very aware of abuse because I have a daughter that works in a, 
um, sexual abuse treatment center, and she has seen everything. And uh, I have seen how uh, boys, and it, the case was boys, but it has happened with girls and with women. I have seen about, read about Africa and nuns in Africa. Um, they, they didn't believe it because he's a prisoner. He cannot do, you know, it's, it's impossible. So it, until you will realize that prisoners are not above us, <laughs> they're not, you know, the last word or a bishop or anybody. We are as much children of Christ as all of them, although they can, uh, do, we cannot do, you know, a certain sacraments or things like that, but we still have the right to our voices, to everything, and speak up and don't be afraid because it's a priest or a bishop to come up. But I think clericalism is one of the reasons all of that is happening. And also, the other thing is some people uh, look at some things in the Bible as they please. I don't like something that say Paul said, like the man is the heart. Everybody thinks, oh, the man, that's why we have patriarchy. The man is the head of the household, and this is the one. That's why I'm so afraid of the, the president nomination of this woman, which belongs to a group that think and they have the the man is her her spiritual guidance and she has to do what she he wants i don't know if you ever read about that uh group and uh, that's what i'm afraid they have to follow in in case of a marriage is the man in case of another group is such and such but what i'm afraid is that people believe that they might have to say you have just to be shut your mouth and do what the man thinks. And I think marriage is a two equal uh, partnership. Thank you. That's right. Women uphold patriarchy too, right? I'm, and we all have a role to play. Well, thank you all so much. I wish we had another hour or two or 10. This has been so fabulous. I just be, I'm going to turn this over to Russ for final uh, prayer and comments, but I want you to, to know that uh, Tara's article is in this book called Crisis and Challenge in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, Perspectives on Decline and Reformation, uh, edited by Deborah Myers and Mary Sue Barnett. Uh, it's, it's actually a wonderful collection of essays and Tara's is outstanding. It, it's, it's worth buying it and reading this. It's, 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 it's extraordinary. So I'm going to turn this over to Russ so that we can finish out with a, a prayer and a few announcements. Thanks, Deb, and thanks, Dr. Tuttle. Um, so just uh, a couple announcements. As Deb mentioned, um, we are going to be having our 30th annual fall event on Thursday, October 22nd, and uh, Tuesday, October 20, I'm, yes, <laughs> and Tuesday, October 27th. I keep mixing up the Tuesdays and Thursdays, but it's the, the 22nd and the 27th. Um, on the Thursday, the 22nd, we will welcome uh, Doris Wagner, who's going to be receiving our Christine Schenk Award. We also welcome Dr. Cecilia Gonzalez Andreu, uh, who is going to give us, I, I think, what's going to be just an absolutely phenomenal keynote presentation on making some sense of uh, 2020 um, and, um, and giving us a direction to look forward uh, and, and go towards. Uh, she's a phenomenal scholar. And um, I've, I've heard her speak uh, on these kinds of topics before, and she's, she's going to be phenomenal. And then on the, the Tuesday session, we welcome uh, uh, Father Brian Massingale, who is going to give a presentation on racism and the Catholic Church. So uh, join us for one or both nights. Um, we'd love to have you for both, but we understand sometimes time's limited. You can visit futurechurch.org 2020 to learn more about that. Also, uh, just hot off the presses is our uh, latest uh, resource on Sister Antona Ibo. Uh, and this is part of our Women Witnesses for Racial Justice series. Um, so this is Sister Antona Ibo, who uh, of, was a trailblazer in many ways, but of note, she marched in Selma 
uh, and was the one of among the first uh, nuns to do so. And she desegregated her own congregation um, when, when she became a sister. So uh, if you visit futurechurch.org slash racial dash justice, let me go ahead and put that in the chat for you. Um, well, my chat window is hidden behind a box here. But if you go to futurechurch.org, you'll see a slider there where you can download that resource. We're also going to be having some presentations about uh, all of these women that we're going to be lifting up um, over the course of uh, several years. Um, finally, I did want to mention uh, one last time. Uh, I know that uh, Dr. Tuttle mentioned this at the beginning of her, um, her talk, but uh, if you do need to talk to someone, uh, you can always call the National uh, Sexual Assault Hotline. Their phone number is 1-800-656-4673. And those calls are confidential. Uh, we also, if you, are, particularly you or someone you know was abused by uh, a member of the clergy, uh, we would recommend reaching out to SNAP. That's snapnetwork.org. Uh, Future Church works closely with them in the church reform movement. Um, and so we trust them. So I wanted to bring those to your attention. I think uh, perhaps, I, I hope I've captured um, the, the prayers of this gathered group of faithful tonight. And so I'm just gonna offer some prayers of petition and feel free to respond um, at home in any way you'd like to these prayers. Pray for the victims of sexual violence and assault, that they may be given strength and grace to share the burden and the truth of their experience, and that they may find believing, supportive, and loving hearts and minds when they do, that they may be healed of physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual wounds and that they may receive full and unqualified justice, we pray. For the empowerment of civil authorities and for laws and policies that uphold the dignity and rights of victims. For the overturning of statutes of limitations and an end to immoral use of legal maneuvers and tactics to keep those guilty from justice, we pray. For Pope Francis, bishops and cardinals, priests, and all those in authority in our church, that they may once and finally be open, transparent, and forthcoming with the truth about sexual assault and the cover-ups, we pray. For abusers and those involved in cover-up, that they may be moved to accept responsibility punishment and penance for their crimes, to seek professional help and ask for forgiveness. We pray. For an end to patriarchy, which marginalizes, excludes, and scapegoats women and LGBTQ persons, for an end to clericalism, which falsely claims the superiority of the ordained over everyone else, and for an openness to healthier theologies and understandings of all humanity, we pray. And for all of us gathered here, that we may be emboldened to bring up uncomfortable topics, to speak out plainly, courageously, prophetically against individuals, systems, and structures 
that abuse and silence, we pray. Amen. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us tonight. And thank you to Dr. Tuttle uh, for sharing your research uh, and, and wisdom and insights with us. It was uh, a difficult topic, but good to do it in, in such a, a loving and compassionate and um, I think energized space. Thank you. <laughs>